Welcome to Crossroads on TVI. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja. Today on our show, we talk about something that's really important, work and life balance. It has been described by some as a necessity. Some actually call it a big joke, while others call it a fallacy. We have an amazing lineup of guests on the phone and in the studio from CEOs, authors, activists to young professionals here to share their opinions. Our first guest is joining us by phone. Thomas Savundra is a technology entrepreneur with over 17 years of experience. Previously, he founded a company called NetFirms, which I have to read this description to you because it's quite the achievement. It was Canada's leading domain name and web hosting company, powering over 1.2 million websites worldwide. He's currently the president and CEO of Sync.com, which he describes as the most private, simplest and secure storage solution for one's important files. Thank you for joining us, Thomas. Thank you, Manjula, for having me on the show. So let me start you off with, I mean, where, why we brought you on is when I interviewed you, I think it was over a year ago, and I asked you about, you know, what do you think of work-life balance? You actually laughed for a couple of minutes before you answered. So let me put that question to you so our, our audience hears it. What are your thoughts on work-life balance as an entrepreneur? As an entrepreneur, I mean, this whole idea of work-life balance is uh, a bit of a fallacy, as you described earlier. I mean, the main reason is when you're trying to, when you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to basically change the world. You're, you're trying to create an imbalance, essentially. You're trying to make a dent in the universe. You're trying to prove to people that the impossible is possible. So, I mean, one can't do that with a whole bunch of balance, essentially. Um, and especially when you're in your 20s and 30s, when you're young, I mean, there's no need for life. I mean, you should, you should just focus on, on work at that point. Um, I mean, all your energy, all your enthusiasm is all there when you're 20. So when, whenever you start a company, you've got to think like you're in your 20s, uh, where there's nothing holding you back. And, of course, when you're talking about balance, the only thing that you should really be balanced about is to keep your, your life in sync, essentially, your, your personal values. I think you need to have that uh, in sync. But in terms of work, I think you should definitely work extra hard especially when you're a lot younger. And the reality is, in any startup or any entrepreneur, you're essentially dead on arrival. Essentially, the idea is dead before it's even launched. So you have to work extra hard to get, just get an idea just above board so you can proceed. So in terms of work-life balance, I've met people that have, you know, have, who claim that they have that work-life balance, and frankly, they're just well-rounded. There's nothing really about special about them in terms of pushing things forward. Um, that being said, it's really a personal choice for each person. Like, as an entrepreneur, you really want to push the boundaries a bit. And for that, you need to really get out of that whole idea that work is bad and life is what you should focus on. In fact, I've got some of the best ideas when I play with my kids, actually. When I play with my kids, I get the best ideas. Even though I should be playing, I'm actually thinking about work. I mean, some will say that that's a bad thing to do, but for me, that has worked pretty well. That's interesting because there's this new idea that people are preaching of that integration between work and life as a way of approach, as a new way of looking at work-life balance. But then let me put this question to you. I mean, you've, you've gone, this is your second company now. You saw that other company that you took from, you know, being sort of a, a little operation out of your home to something bigger. Um, have your opinions and habits changed um, with regards to work-life balance since, from that first company to the second? I mean, yes, uh, definitely. I think uh, this time around, uh, I'm a lot, I've, I think I've gotten a lot more wiser in terms of when you're in your 20s, there's a lot of things you're, you're learning and that you haven't learned those issues with respect to hiring people, figuring out what your core values are. All those things are a little bit easier. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that I've taken more attempts to, to write down goals. I think uh, I used to be someone who never really sort of wrote things down. But accidentally, in my previous company, you can say that I, we used to write goals down. And just by the act of writing that down, eventually those goals actually come to fruition. So uh, this time around, you still need to have the energy as if you're in your 20s, like that, that confidence and boldness. But at the same time, um, you know, 
I, I think I'm reading a lot more in terms of, uh, you know, I spend more time learning as opposed to just just experimenting. So um, this time around, there's more habits that I'm trying to push forward. Like, for example, um, spending some more personal time, um, you know, before you start the day off. I think a lot of times we kind of scurry off to work and don't have enough time to sort of reflect personally. Uh, I think that's the, the change that I've made in the last 15 years. 15 years is the more personal time to before I start the day off. Interesting. So um, again, you know, we talked about the fact that you are a fan of front-loading um, hard work to early years in your life. Uh, what would be your advice to young people that are thinking of, of be it a, a, corp, a career in the corporate world or entrepreneurship? What would your advice be? I think, you know, you know life happens. Uh, bottom line, you don't have to worry about life. I think the opportunities that you get in your 20s are only there in your 20s. There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, so definitely, like, take the risks when you're 20. I mean, it's hard to start things uh, when you're in your 30s and 40s. So especially when you're young, um, you know, the whole world is your oyster. You can just do whatever you wish to do because for the lifestyle that you wish to have in the future, you have to front load and do the work right now when you're a lot younger. Um, you, can, you can earn back that time. I think time is a, the most precious resource you have, even more important than money. So um, I, I think you definitely have to do the work early on. I mean, for, forget this whole concept of work-life work work balance, especially in your 20s. I mean, you don't need a life in your 20s. You can just focus on work at that point. We're trying here not to laugh in the studio. You're getting us very excited. I, mean, I, I think a 20-year-old does not really need a life because, the bottom line, there's so much temptations and things for them to do. I think it's far more important just to have some routines and, and try to push forward. And I think you, the crazy ideas that you can get in the 20s can only happen in your 20s, the, the craziness. Mm -hmm. So I think embrace that if you want to, you know, make an impact. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate your uh, points on this. We're going to debate them now. All right. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Take care. Okay, so <laughs> you guys have a lot of fodder. Let me first introduce both of you, though both of you, I think, have been on Crossroads before. So our, here's our, our guest in the studio. Vaishna Satyamuthi is a naturopathic doctor at Naturopathic Living Medical Solutions in Markham, and she also teaches at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine as a first-year teaching assistant for clinical psychology. She maintains a general family practice and treats patients of all ages and conditions using evidence-based natural therapies. Kubes Nava is a lawyer by profession, practicing in the corporate and commercial real estate space. An entrepreneur and an avid volunteer, he's currently pursuing his longtime desire of publishing a book that expands on his Master's of Law thesis on the responsibility to protect doctrine. A separate topic that we will bring you back for. I'm very interested about that. So you heard what he had to say, um, what uh, Thomas was very frank uh, in talking about. You know, do you, first of all, let me start you off by asking you, Kubis, I'll ask you, um, young people in their 20s and early 30s, are they, you know, you've been around, you've been in groups that have a lot of young people. Are they thinking consciously, making decisions on the trade-offs trade between success and work-life balance? I think they are definitely thinking about that more often now than they ever have before. I think a big reason for that is technology uh, with social media and constant communication and constant new ideas coming to the forefront. I think it's disrupting the old uh, concept of what a work-life balance is. And, 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 the, and the topic that you spoke to about the integration is also now people are figuring out a, a different way to think than just seeing it as separate parts of the life. And I think that's where Thomas was speaking to, uh, uh, to understanding it's it's not as linear as it used to be and it's more so uh, boxes of your life and choices that you chose and obligations that you sign on to and you try to prioritize and balance that as opposed to seeing two things because a lot of us uh, don't know where to put volunteerism. Is that uh, work related or is that personal because it, it gives personal satisfaction as well. So when you mix it all of that I think it's I look at it more so as balancing your priorities uh, in life. And, and I think uh, nowadays with that kind of concept coming to the forefront in, in, in social media and the internet and people having the access to that kind of information, I think it is disrupting. Uh, we're very early on, so how that, that materializes in the real world, we're still figuring it out, but I think... So you're telling me people consciously come out of school and actually think about work-life balance? I don't know if right out of school, but at, definitely after their first experience of 
that tilt, because we, we don't talk about work-life balance because it tilts in the favor of life. Yeah. We usually talk about it when it tilts in the True. favor of work. And when you first experience that, that, that stretch of your uh, resources and, and, and when you first start realizing that, it, it probably puts a negative effect on all your obligations and your personal life. That's when you start coming to terms with how you balance that. And I think at that point, people start looking out. And before, people didn't have a venue to look out and ha figure that out. Now, it's a lot more available, people trying to figure out techniques and, 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 and uh, opportunities how to get that balance more fixed. Interesting. Vaishna, I know that you have a uh, young clientele as well, right? So what, I mean, young professionals. So what are you noticing? Are, is this something that people are concerned about in their sort of early 20s or even early 30s? I do agree with Kubas and that it is now a question that I think most people do bring up and it comes to the forefront, especially when you do look at our parents. They stuck with, you know, one career, one, one, we had an entire generation that had nine to five, came home, took care of your kids. But now it's a, a completely different dynamic when we are linked to technology, we are constantly linked to our emails, and we also have the reflection of our peers in which the work hard, which I do agree with Thomas saying mentality, and then also the play hard mentality. So when you're looking at work-life balance, I think people often question, how is it that I can balance the things that I love in my life and that I'm passionate for in a healthy manner? And often I think the balance of that play is coming into perfection. How do I constantly improve my life mm -hmm. so that it can meet different aspects and different obligations in a manner that I am content with? So you're almost indicating that people actually have, it's, it's not a matter of balance, but the fact that they're trying to achieve perfection in each aspect of their... I think that's ultimately what most of us try and not say that we want to achieve perfection, but I think by balance we're striving for that, that improvement. How do I improve my life? How do I make it successful both in all aspects of home and work? And when we have that tilt going towards work more, you know, we see that we have to let go of more of our personal obligations and going back into that ladder and finding a way to kind of make both aspects work. So let me ask you a personal question, since now that you've agreed on the show and you can't leave, right? <laughs> agreed to be on the show. Have you struggled with the idea of work-life balance? I mean, you're, I, I had to really pare down both of your bios. You both do a lot. Have you struggled with that, Kubes? I, I definitely have, and I can, I can remember the first time I, I absolutely struggled with it and had to sort of look inward and see how I'm going to move forward is uh, I was in 2009. Um, it was a time where I was doing my master's uh, on a topic that related to back home. Uh, I was working. Uh, I'm, I'm a married man, so I have to bring in some income. <laughs> and uh, at that time, t 2009 was the onslaught of the war back going on in Sri Lanka, as well as post when the war ended, people were running around trying to see how they can best help. And it was something that wasn't planned. So everybody just had to sort of sit out their resources and give out their resources as best as they could. And I was one, one of those people trying to do the same. And I, but after about a year of trying to juggle all that, I, re I started realizing I was doing a lot more harm than I was good, not just to myself and my health and my uh, sort of uh, priorities and obligations, but to the actual obligations I signed up on. Why? In what way? Because I stretched myself out too thin. I, I was uh, sort of trying to serve as my, many needs as, as I possibly can, and I, and I think I took it to a point where I wasn't being effective in each individual need, and I could have been more effective. So uh, after a year of realizing that my potential and my obligations uh, were not being met to the fullest, I had to sort of step back. And, and I, it was a, a very clear step back that I had to do because uh, you know, I had that burnt out feeling. And luckily I had a couple of good mentors around me and they sort of helped me to understand the importance of prioritizing, mm -hmm. uh, the power of saying no. Uh, uh, that, was a, that was something that I couldn't do before. And, uh, and by empowering myself to say no and, and only do the prioritize obligations that I knew that I could do well and then take on one by one as I sort of completed the obligations. I learned to better balance that. So it was Were there any signs that you felt like you were burning out? Was it, was it more just, you know, drop deadlines or was it more physical? Uh, it was drop deadlines, but it was the sort of the inter internalization of the frustration. So as I wasn't doing a good job in one obligation, it exacerbated my frustrations and it played out in my other obligations and it sort of, it was a cumulative negative cycle that kept mm. on going and, 
And it was more so the, the feelings that I was. I'm generally a, a, a positive person, and then during that time, I started really getting into a negative cycle. And you don't really start to realize that till it gets to a point where it's noticeable, live different, and you're a, at a different place than you were a year ago. Uh, mm. in, in, internally as well. You don't notice how far down that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So. Vaishna, I mean, you have the same kind of a CV and you're, you're also relatively, like not relatively new, I mean you've been practicing for a while now, but you're also facing the, the sort of odd, you know, request to do other things. I know we've spoken about, you know, you asked me, should I write articles on this? So you seem to be adding more things to your plate. Have you struggled with this yourself? Every day. <laughs> but to be truthful, every day. Um, I do think that it's a question that I have in my head when you do start off your day. And when you do begin to notice the physical impacts that it has to yourself, whether or not, you know, you have to stay up an hour later, which means you're getting an hour less of sleep, or you have to cut back on a social activity that you're really looking forward to. Um, the, the biggest aspect I've learned to incorporate is to be honest with myself and to be present with myself. So, you know, is, is this something that I need to do? If it is, if so, then I need to execute it. Um, and also to be present. I find that oftentimes we're in this, and Thomas made a good point, we, we hurry off into our day and we, have, we just go full force from zero to 100. And the moment that you, you start you know, tripping over your own stones and are, you're two steps ahead of yourself without really realizing what you're doing, I think that's a big key in that you may need to take a step back, evaluate, prioritize, and set goals as well as limits for yourself. And I think that's a hard thing for most people to do. So then let me ask you about what he just said, right? And I think he yeah. said it <laughs> enough times that you know where he stands on this issue. But, you know, one of the comments that he said is he thinks He's, he, does, he thinks people should ignore that aspect in their 20s and go for it. What do you think of that? I think he has valid points, but as a healthcare professional, when you do see the impact that that can have on one's health and well-being, you do begin to question that. And there's a great article in a book, uh, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, and the second regret is, I wish I hadn't worked so much, and that regret actually came from males most of all in their lives. When you look at the average individual, you spend 40 to 50 hours a week working. That's 80,000 hours over a lifetime between 25 and 65. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of your lifetime and at the end of your lifespan at 80, when you do reflect back to hear that that's one of the most popular regrets, that does cause you to reevaluate. And I do have patients in their 20s or 30s that come in and I, you know, their work-life balance is fine. It's fine until you take their blood pressure and your work-life balance may need to be reevaluated or it's fine until you'd like to discuss os aspects of fertility and your sperm count doesn't meet that criteria. Okay. And that often is what causes the shift in people to you know, reevaluate and take a step back. And it is easy to say, work hard, play hard, go hard in your 20s. But your body has to last you well beyond your 20s, well beyond your 30s. Especially now with the Especially way, how long now. people, yeah. With the way we live and how we live. So I do agree with that aspect, but you do also have to be conscious with how hard you are pushing yourself mm -hmm. because as Kubis also said, you know, your adrenal glands only can take so much. Your body can only take so much. Yeah. You can only take so much. And so if you're not there to you know, head that company, how is it going to run itself? It isn't. Mm -hmm. So it's important, I think, to take all aspects of what he said, but as well keep in mind. Keep in mind. Okay, we're going to take a break. We'll come back to this discussion. Uh, very interesting discussion. You're watching uh, Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Stay with us. Welcome back to Crosswords on TVI. We're speaking about work-life balance with Vaishna Satyamuthi and Kubes uh, Nava. And having a very interesting discussion at that. And now we have Krishna Saravanamuthu on the phone. Um, he's very familiar to this audience as well. He's been on the show a couple of times. I I'd like to read a little bio about him regardless so people know everything that he's working on. He tells me that he's someone who tries to aspire towards work-life balance. He is um, aspiring also to work in international law, specializing in genocide studies, peacemaking, and the right of self-determination. Formerly as 
um, National Executive Representative of the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario. He represented over 300,000 students to the federal government. He's an executive of the National Council of Canadian Tamils and on the Canadian Peace Alliance Steering Committee. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Mujula. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me today. And again, I apologize that I can't be there in person today. That's okay. It's, we, I think we can get your views across and it gives you a little bit more time to work on everything that you have to. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> what's interesting is that I saw a note on um, Facebook that you put up about being on the show and this is what it said. You said, um, I'm going on the show to talk about something um, that you described as something I'm still learning about as I stumble along, balance in life. What did you mean? Well, you know, balance is something that over the last few years, I've come to see uh, or put more of a priority on. Um, you know, this is something that I hadn't got quite right just yet, and I find that it, it is really a process of trial and error. So, you know, some days I'm better at finding that work-life balance, and other days I'm, I'm, I'm a complete failure at it. Now, you do work on uh, a lot of things. What are some of the things that you do to kind of maintain that balance, that sanity? Uh, over the last few years, some of the things I've discovered, first of all, is martial arts. Uh, I've been training in a style of martial arts called Muay Thai, uh, which incorporates the use of, you know, eight different weapons from the human body. I've been training under uh, crew Jennifer Lampier at York Muay Thai. In addition to that, I've also taken up meditation. I try to meditate every morning and every night. Um, and, you know, in general, I just try to live... Uh, a positive, holistic, healthy lifestyle. I try to run as often as I can, at least three or four times a week. I'll try to run five kilometers. Um, and, and then, you know, in general, I think eating healthy is also important uh, to ensure that you can sustainably continue doing the work that you're, that you're passionate about. Now, did you have any point, it seems like, you know, you've, you've actually taken very dedicated um, steps towards maintaining that sanity. You know, medication is a very hard practice and so is the martial arts. So was there some kind of an epiphany that you had that got you on that path? Yeah, you know, a few years ago, I, I was I was the head of the student union at York University and, and there I represented about 50,000 undergrads. Um, although I was technically required to work five days a week, I was pretty much working seven days a week. And then in addition to that, I had my um, you know, I had my hands in, in several other areas. I was involved, I was starting to get involved with the Tamil struggle. Uh, I was doing work for the City of Toronto and the Toronto Transit Commission. Um, I was getting involved with the Canadian Peace Movement. And, and so I found that, you know, seven days a week, almost 17 hours a day, I was doing work. And it came at a serious expense. It came at the expense of both my own personal happiness, uh, my health. It came at the expense of my friendships, my family relationships, and, and you know, even even um, any type of intimate bonds that I may have had with people, those those were also sacrificed as well. And so I started to notice that while I was doing very well in one area of my life, other areas of my life were completely suffering and were being neglected. And so that's why I decided to take um, step toward, steps towards, you know, to a certain degree being a bit selfish and just focusing on myself. And I've, and I've realized through time that sometimes it is okay to be selfish and sometimes it is okay to focus on yourself because that means that you're giving yourself the ability to be successful and to make a positive contribution. Mm, interesting. That's an interesting learning. Now, l let me take this in another direction. Do you think that there are sort of environmental or more importantly systematic pressures that can make young people want to um, struggle with work-life balance? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as a student, uh, right here in Ontario, for instance, we're paying some of the highest tuition fees that we have in all of North America. And so what this does is compel students to work often two to three part-time jobs in addition to full-time studies. So then where do we find the time in 24 hours to then exercise, to eat properly, to spend time with our family and with our friends, to do things like meditation? So unfortunately, finding that work-life balance is a bit of a privilege. Mm. I see. Well, thank you so much for sharing your views. I, I really am. Give us the name of that martial arts again. I find I find that very interesting. What was that that you were practicing again? It's called Muay Thai. Mm. Uh, and if you're interested, or if any of your audience is interested in learning Muay Thai, I train at a gym called York Muay Thai. And I would definitely suggest coming and checking it out. It's not for everybody, but I can definitely guarantee that you'll be sweating.
Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. We'll let you get on with your day. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. I'll see you soon. Okay. Okay, well, you heard his um, a point of view on the systematic um, pressures. I mean, we've heard of things that we do to ourselves when we are moved by, Kuwais, you talked about being moved by the situation around the, the conflict and actually causing you to do uh, more. Do you think that there are other pressures other than the tuition one I've heard several times, too? Mm -hmm. Do you think there are other sort of environmental or systematic pressures that make people want to sort of work really hard or kind of ignore that balance? I believe today, especially with the concept of technology, we're expected to respond to uh, a request a lot quicker than before. So if you receive an email, for example, from work, there's no excuse for you not to have it or not to have seen it by Monday, technically, if you don't have a smartphone or if you don't have access. I mean, unless you live under a rock, pretty much you don't have access to the internet. So the systematic pressure of the integration of technology um, has crept or creeped its way back into our lives and I don't know anyone that, that doesn't travel without their smartphone or doesn't have their iPad on them mm -hmm. or doesn't have a Bluetooth device in or are starting to incorporate Bluetooth devices into their cars so they can take calls. I've had numerous friends say they generally will have to pull over on the side of the road at least once or twice a week to answer a work call and this these were things that didn't happen before but the mm -hmm. expectations for us to respond and be in constant contact with our work environment or, or company or corporation that we're at has changed over over many years and particularly I think is something that our generation constantly struggles with. It's the contradiction of technology because yeah. technology was actually supposed to be enabled to us to just do more but now we do more all the time, mm -hmm. right? Kabeis, if you want to add, are there other things that you think? Um, I think there's uh, something that I kind of uh, was always wondering how it affected me. It was uh, we come from, uh, we're the next generation to a generation of par our parents who are probably one of the most hardest working uh, generations of all time in our history is because they had to uproot from their homes and go to a new country with very little. I mean, this is a similar story for all of our parents. And so they had no option of work-life balance, I think, and they did their best just to try to provide for families. So as children of those kind of parents, and as children always do, they either emulate their parents or they rebel against their parents. So I think in that context, I had situations where I'm, I was thinking, I'm never going to work hard as my parents because I saw the sacrifices that they had to do and uh, because they focus on work all the time. And then other times, but you're still, you still sort of, you are your parents' uh, uh, children. So you, you, so I've, I've had times where I had to sort of rebel against that whole concept of working hard uh, and then at the same time, like just having to fight with that naturally ingrained in me. So uh, mm. I think our, our parents' generation and, and juxtaposing it to us, uh, I find it a very difficult sort of reconciliation to do uh, on how much to work and how much to balance and uh, finding that out. And That's just, interesting. Just to go on that, I also feel that sometimes we feel that we have to work harder because our parents provided us with so much. So, you know, the and they started with really and they nothing. they started yeah. with really nothing, like one suitcase or, you know. It's they a hard story to uh, go against. Uh, and, and it's hard to live by and yeah. it's hard to achieve, you know, when you look back at our parents and how much they've come across, it also makes you want to work harder, in my case, and do better and provide the life that they, o for your, for them, that they always wanted you to achieve for, for both yourself and also for, for future generations. Mm -hmm. So I, I often think that we are that in-between generation where, you know, we, we put the pressures on ourselves because of what, everything that we've seen and also everything that we are expected to have an outcome. I'm, I have many friends within the South Asian community who are trying to balance their work and also the knock of their parents saying, you know, when are you having children or when are you getting married and you know, living both the dynamics of the traditional roots with the integration into Canadian society. So today. that becomes another struggle. Do you think that there's also sort of differing, like definitely I would say between my parents and I, there's differing requirements for financial stability or what you want or what you need or you know sort of how you look like when you leave the house do you think that there's other pressures of that that are a little bit more superficial do you think there are other pressures of that nat nature that young people face materialism yeah perhaps materialism i'm just curious do you think that is in some way different between our parents generation and and this one I absolutely think so. Um, okay. I think our parents did a lot with very little, mm -hmm. and uh, 
So there is that uh, notion that w coming from a uh, generation like that, are we being too materialistic, too hard on ourselves by wanting that? I mean, we all understand the, the, the negatives of being too materialistic, but we also live in a world that is embedded by that. So it, it, you're going to be entrenched in that kind of materialism. But when you, have a, uh, when you look at your parents' generation who did so much with so little and didn't really fall into the materialism world as much, there is that sense of guilt, and I go through it all the time myself, of, <laughs> of am I being a bit too materialistic for my needs? I could have done much more with the money I had, uh, yeah. with better, better initiatives, but uh, that's another fight that we have to fight. That is well. another fight. Yeah, because I would think that their requirements for what they defined as happy is a, it, I mean, what people now really want to be happy is so much more that it actually takes more work to achieve it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so um, let me take you to another. This is just some interesting um, data that I found. So in the corporate world, there have been ch some changes. The corporate world was moving towards being more flexible. These are just two examples. But you know, Best Buy's new CEO canceled their results-only work environment program. It was called ROWE. Then Yahoo CEO, this one actually made a lot of the news, uh, canceled their work from home program. So in talking to your networks and friends, do you think that the corporate world environment is truly embracing this, this work-life balance thing, or do you think it's going the opposite way? Um, no, I, think, yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, definitely, uh, going back to technology, I think it's going to disrupt it, and I think it's going to shift the work-life balance. And if, whether corporations want to do it or not, they will be forced in the near future to do it. Now, we're very early on in this whole idea of how to integrate technology so that we can have this results-oriented uh, setting and work from home and have at the same time accountability for executives to be able to hold their employees who are not in the physical space accountable. I think we're learning all that, but uh, I think that direction is moving forward because the, the masses are changing their perception of what this work-life balance is, and they're going towards this idea of uh, needing that balance, and it's not just put FaceTime in the office because you need to be from nine to five, and that, that mentality is soon becoming a dead mentality. But now, how to change that and say, okay, if you're working from home, how do I hold you accountable for all your tasks? How do I know that you're, 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 you're going to do what you need to do and sort of measure and all that? That's a, that's a sort of a mechanism that we have to figure out, and I think that's what went through those two companies. They were trying something out. It maybe didn't work in the best. So it doesn't mean that they don't believe in the concept. Absolutely. It's just it's an evolution. It's an evolution, I think. Interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about the health impacts. I know you've mentioned this a couple of times. Yeah. You know, what is it? What are, what are people looking at by, by sort of being workaholics, per se, or just too focused on that one aspect of their lives? So the first aspect is burnout, and that's something that we've um, previously discussed and mentioned. So burnout can present in different mannerisms for different people. The first is exhaustion and fatigue. That often sets in as the first two things. Um, sleep disturbances. So are you waking up in the middle of the night? Do you have trouble falling asleep? Do you have trouble attaining a good quality of sleep? The second is um, in terms of the digestive system and the immune function. Do you get sick often? Mm -hmm. you know, are you one of those people that can't go to the bathroom every day? Do you have trouble eating certain foods? And as well, as it can then trickle out to different other, to other aspects in terms of cardiovascular system, high blood pressure, you know, high cholesterol. Though these are two important aspects that you know, our generation, both in terms of our current generation, our parents' generation face all the time. And then you look at diabetes, are your blood sugar levels regulating? And this can then trickle over to your menstrual cycles. And then this also can go further on in terms of other aspects. So when you want to have a family, fertility is one aspect that it can come up in. So it's, you feel like it's, it's one of those it's slippery slopes? It's one slope. of those slippery slopes. So mm -hmm. at the first signs of any um, burnout, exhaustion, fatigue, not being mentally alert, it is important to seek a healthcare provider and to speak with your medical doctor or naturopathic doctor or um, someone that you can trust and turn to to see how you can go about and fix you know, what's the imbalance in there. Mm -hmm. And so I often tell people, you know, a rule of eight, just to start off with, and Krishna also mentioned it, um, eight glasses of water, it's easy to do. Um, <laughs> if, if you're a CEO on the ground or, you know, you're just trying to make ends meet, it's, you can do that. Eight different colored fruits and vegetables, that's really easy to achieve throughout the day. If you want, you can start it off with a smoothie in the morning, throw in a banana, cup some spinach, almond milk, you're off to, and you're off to a good set. 
eight minutes of meditation or eight minutes of gratitude and Krishna mentioned this and there have been studies to prove the aspects of meditation can change and both Thomas also mentioned it starting your day off with meditation and being present and if, if meditation you know, is a little bit off your territory eight minutes of being present you know devote eight minutes of your day to taking a step back away from your desk or your office simply re reflect on your day and that mm -hmm. may be just writing down tasks mm -hmm that you are grateful for or the gratitude that you have for the day that's present or it can even just be something as simply as breathing. Eight minutes of deep breathing can make mm. a big difference. And then eight hours of, of sleep. sleep. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Yes. I was like, don't get to that. <laughs> so okay. eight hours of sleep. And there yeah. are those rare individuals that can go on five hours and four hours and think you should too. But their studies have, show, have shown that eight hours of sleep is optimal and essential. Mm -hmm. And it's that task of, you know, reach for the moon, you can aim for the, and land in the stars. So aim for eight hours of sleep and, it, and try and achieve that. This week it just may be six and a half, next week it may be seven. But if you can follow those rules of eight, you can really maintain that aspect of your health. And it's so easy to remember. Sleep, meditation, fruits and vegetables, and water. And that, that, that's a good way to start to integrate that health into your, into your everyday aspect, regardless of what you do. Great advice. Good <laughs> advice. I know. Very I, I advice. should have been, we should have <laughs> been taking notes. I think Thomas may come on the line again to, to hear that advice. Okay, we're going to take a break. Thank you, Vaishnav. We're going to take a break. Um, viewers, stay with us. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salraja. We're going to come back for more of this discussion. Welcome back to Crossroads on TVI. We're speaking about work-life balance with Vaishna Satyamuthi and Kubes Nava. And uh, in a couple of minutes, we will have Brett Wilson, author and entrepreneur, joining us on the phone. Now, the question that I wanted to put to you is I've heard I, I, heard, I love the 8 to 8 to 8 to 8 rule. Um, I think we discussed it while everyone was on break. You know, the question that I ask you is uh, something that Thomas said, that there is this idea that in your 20s, if you don't go strong, you miss out on opportunities. Um, you miss out on a chance to sort of perhaps climb the corporate ladder a lot faster. What do you say about that? You know, do you think that people right now, young people that are listening to you or, or younger Kubis, would you, um, you know, give them the advice to go strong or to slow down? What would you say? I think uh, uh, Thomas also sort of um, qualified his comment to his entrepreneurial spirit and, and he said it was a personal choice. So I think his personal choice was to disrupt and imbalance the current status quo and he was so in that sense he, he that was his main obligation in his 20s so he wanted to push that forward and now I, I think the personal choice is very important so if you're person if you've made the choice to sort of have other obligations in your life if you're married if you have a kid if you you know you have parents that you want to spend time with you don't you don't have the option of putting a li uh, work as your only mm -hmm. option in the 20s. So I think it's definitely a personal choice. And he also spoke about, uh, you know, on his second career, he, he looks back now and he, uh, you know, collects his thoughts. And that's a very important thing too, because by either collecting your thoughts through meditation, through setting goals, you start to prioritize what is important to you and then you follow that. So I agree that for Thomas, good, good thing that he only worked, worked on uh, work uh, for his 20s because he created an amazing company and that's that's the benefit of putting that kind of uh, mm -hmm. effort in but I think it's absolutely a personal choice and I think definitely he's right 20s you can't get back the energy the kind of dedication of time that you could put towards that and you should uh, capitalize that but is it the only thing that uh, I would spend on no I think it's absolutely a personal choice and so depends. how are you how I mean you're a very busy man and you're you know getting prepared or in the process of writing a book how do you Aim for work-life balance. Do you have it? Do you feel you have it now? Uh, no, I think I think I'm like Krishna and and Vaishnavi, where we're all fighting for that struggle all the time. I I I have sort of this sort of deathbed view on life, so I always sort of look back and say, is this sort of something that progressed my life forward? 
And work, many, many opportunities in work did do that. It taught me discipline, it taught me organizational skills, efficiencies. And so if that is progressing my life forward, I think it's an obligation that I need to give it, even though it's maybe give, I'm giving more time than I wanted to because of work-life uh, situations. But I absolutely go through a, a process where I reevaluate and collect my thoughts. And mm -hmm. if I'm spending time, and if I feel that the work is not giving me what I need, then I reevaluate and I go back. So but it's a lot of reflection. A lot of reflection. And I think that's very important. If you saw that, that's a common thread that every speaker had talked about, mm -hmm. is that collection of thoughts and, and reflection, because it really helps you. Otherwise, the work-life balance gets crazy when you don't have any control over it. And mm -hmm. usually you don't have any control over it, it when you allow it to sort of guide you as opposed to reflecting and let, let your sort of priorities guide that balance. Interesting. So let, let me bring that to you, Vaishnava, right? Um, first of all, you know, I'd love to hear your opinion on, on if you think that, you know, when people come to you, they're concerned that I'm going to miss out on opportunities. I can't simply slow down, right? What, what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with Kubes, and I think what Thomas said was important. I don't think that um, your age should define you in terms of how hard you're working and how hard you're going. I personally think it should be more of an 80-20 rule at any point of your life. You, know, you give it 80% and you work hard 80% and you have that 20% of your life to reflect and sit back. And Thomas made a very good point in that some of his best ideas have come to him when he's spending time with his children mm. or when he's meditating. And that, That's a good point. And that yeah. catalyzes that 80% and allows him to be better at what he's doing and I think it also comes down to quality and not quantity. You can go f full force 100%, that's what I say to my patients, you can go full force 100% and hit every single opportunity but are you doing it to the true potential and capacity that you can do that to? And sometimes you do have to step back and give yourself that 20% or that hour in the day to exercise, meditate, go to yoga and reflect upon what it is that you've accomplished for the day. Okay, so tell us then how you go about, <laughs> because I know you, would you say that you struggle? With I do struggle. Okay. So one thing I do do, and I'm, uh, uh, I try and do it often, is meditate and yoga. And I've done that through uh, finding, you know, a, a yoga center near me. I am, you know, Krishna has Muay Thai. I have Moksha Yoga. I'm a huge okay. fan of Moksha Is Yoga. Is that the hot tea? It's the hot yoga, but okay. they have different classes available. So I will try to ensure and schedule my day so that I hit one class that day. Mm -hmm. And I will go in there and sweat and exercise and meditate and increase my serotonin and my dopamine, so the feel-good hormones. And I leave feeling recharged and able to to tackle the rest of my day or tackle the rest of tomorrow and the day after. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that I've incorporated and I have found that keeping a routine is important because once you establish a routine, you establish habits. When you establish habits, it doesn't become a routine anymore and it becomes a way of life. So if you can find one thing in your day, whether that's even just simply being mindful and having lunch away from the desk, I tell people, you know, turn away, spend 15 minutes and mindfully eat your meal. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes all you need to get recharged and go back about your day. Well, viewers, we couldn't complete the show without an interview with Brett Wilson. And why this interview is important is because he brings a very fresh perspective to the bevy of success books out there because it isn't just a book about how to be a millionaire or how to be successful, which he can certainly write, but it's one also about some of the mistakes and some of the struggles that you can have getting there. So let me just give you a little bit of a bio about, uh, he's well known. He's one of Canada's best known oil and gas entrepreneurs, recognizable to many uh, as a former dragon on Dragon's Den. He co-founded one of Canada's leading investment banks in that industry, First Energy Capital Corp, and is also a noted philanthropist. For his many contributions, he has been named Alberta's a business person of the year, Calgary's person of the year, and a very exciting one, was appointed as a member to the Order of Canada. He joins us now to talk about his book, Redefining Success. Yet again, that fresh view that I mentioned. Um, hi, Mr. Wilson. How are you? Um, very, very well, thank you. And I prefer Brett. My dad gets to be Mr. Wilson. Oh, okay. okay. We'll stick to... Well, I don't want to age you in that way, so we'll stick to calling you <laughs> Brett. So, you All know, good. So again, you know, tell our viewers this. I mean, you could have written these other books and you see them in, you know, the bookstores that you go to, the books on how to succeed and, you know, how to be wealthy and all of that. 
why a book on redefining success and, and, and title, the subtitle being Still Making Mistakes? Well, a couple of uh, anecdotal comments. When we were first putting the book together, um, the original title was much longer. It was really, it was called at that time, several years ago, Redefining Success in a Wealth-Obsessed World. And the real point I'm driving at there is that we have a predisposition to immediately define success for most people in the context of the size of their office, the size of their car, size of their holiday, size of their home, size of their wallet. It's all materialistic and very little time is first spent thinking about what is life really about. So that's the first part. The second was when I was working with Penguin. We were sort of trying to shorten the title and I asked the question, would you call your book simply Still Making Mistakes? And my response was, my life's not that screwed up. It's just a subtitle and it's a theme that I think we as a society sometimes give too much credence to the mistakes people make and they tend to make that the headline and how they define people by their mistakes. And in my mind, if you're not trying, you won't make any mistakes. So conversely, if you are trying and you're learning and you're moving ahead in life, you're bound to make some mistakes. So let's stop being so um, so un-Canadian and criticizing people who do make mistakes. So that's kind of the essence of my approach was a little different than most. It wasn't your traditional business book in the context of work harder and it will come to you. you know, this was about choose what really means success to you and then work hard. Work hard at your family relationships, work hard at your health, work hard at your learning, work hard at your business. Now, you know, you've spoken very frankly about certain moments in your life that caused you, epiphanies, if you may, that caused you to rethink that success. Can you tell us about them? Oh, there was, there was many, for sure. I guess probably the most pivotal or the, um, the one that sort of resonates when I'm talking with uh, with friends is the night that I was uh, stuck at home babysitting. And that in itself starts the conversation because as a parent, you're not babysitting, you're parenting. So there I was babysitting and I was stuck at home because I wanted to be at an art auction. Again, a materialistic perspective on where my priorities were. I was stuck at home, two of my kids were with me and I decided to participate in the art auction by phone. Well, that's all fine, except the phone rings several times and I don't really pay much attention to it and I'm watching the time. Um, and I finally realized that I may have missed it. So I told the auction house and said, hey, what's going on? And they said, oh, we've already sold the piece you wanted. Well, I was furious. And it turns out that the woman at the auction house said, a little girl answered the phone and said you weren't home. Well, I went upstairs and I had a little chat with that little girl. And, of course, I was angry. I was frustrated. I was, um, frankly, incompetent as a parent in the rage that I was in. And I remember shouting at this little girl, eight, nine, ten years old. She's ultimately looking at them with these big brown eyes. And I said to her, what the hell? I was a little more enforceful than that. What the hell are you doing telling someone I'm not home? And she looked at me and said, because you never are. It was wow. the easy answer. And that was the moment, I think. I mean, there was lots of pressure from my wife um, to be home more, but it just didn't resonate. And marriage was failing, so it was easier to be at the office. But when a little girl looks up at you and says, you know, I don't tell people you're home because you never are, that really resonated in terms of the life balance um, mess that I was in at the time. So, Brett, how do you define success now? I would use the word uh, multifaceted. I have a multifaceted definition of success. It's partly about my wealth, for sure, because I've enjoyed working. Working gives me privilege to make a difference in terms of some of the charity work I do with money, charity work I do with my time, charity work I do with leadership. So that's all those things are success to me. But really, the overarching theme for me, and it's, a cynic can easily say, well, look, you've made money. You can afford to now be entirely focused on family. But the focus on happiness, which is really a concentric circle of my health, my family, and my friends, that's really the focus. And quite frankly, I have more than enough wealth, but I don't have more than enough time. And uh, I wish I could go back in time, but I can't. Um, so that comes back to, to answer your question in a simplistic word, I have a multifaceted definition of success that really encompasses all the things I do, but it really for sure encompasses what I call the size of the smile. So what are your thoughts? I mean, we've had, uh, we've had a couple of discussions here about work-life balance. What are your thoughts on work-life balance? Do you think you know, it, the concept is just you know, one big joke, a lie? Do you think it's, it's a necessity? Well, I start with that whole issue of what I call it redefining success. So you step one is to define success for you. And if you define success for the next five, ten years of your life as purely business, 
then you're going to focus your priorities on purely business. And that's why I really emphasize the core messaging inside the book is about taking a hard look at really where you want to be. And if the only thing you're thinking about is business, you're bound to let other things slip. So if you've got a multifaceted definition of success, you will then set priorities that will line up with those. And my hope is you'll follow those priorities with passion. In my life, I chose to make my number one priority because you're of no use to anybody if you've lost your health. So my physical, emotional, spiritual, mental health, however you want to define your health, make sure you take care of that. That's number one. Number two is family. And everyone's got challenges or speed bumps, and I can go toe-to-toe with people in terms of challenges and dysfunction. But the bottom line is I continue to try and continue to work on the relationships with my siblings, with my dad, my dad, and I just recently lost my stepmom, um, and, of course, my children. So those are important. That's number one, being health. Number two, being children. Number three is friends. The essence of life for me is the friendships I've had. Number four is education. Number five is my career. And number six is community. And I always say that you have to stack them up. And every hour you spend, you have a choice amongst those six areas in my world uh, as to where you spend your time. And you've got to choose wisely because you only get each hour once. So what would you tell a younger version of yourself? And this is our final question to you. To a younger version, uh, hopefully they've read the book and hopefully something's resonated for them. It's, um, look, run hard, but run hard against a set of priorities that make sense for your definition of success because you're going to end up being a whole lot happier. About five, no, but oh, now it's 15 years ago, my brother-in-law's Christmas card uh, said, our needs are few, they're easily met, we're very happy. And I stopped and looked at that and thought, my needs are many, they're not easily met, and I'm not happy. What am I doing wrong? Oh. Great line to end that note on. Thank you so much. And for our viewers, this book is available, actually widely available. You can uh, definitely find it at any of the bookstores that we have um, in the GTA and throughout Canada. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, let's hope that, that you know, the thinking that you're putting forward puts a dent in uh, what people are thinking on work-life balance. Well, thank you for the privilege of sharing this conversation with you. Great. So there you have it, folks. Um, we are just, uh, you know, this has been a very interesting discussion. I think we will continue to have ones on this topic. It seems to be uh, interesting to our audience. I've certainly gotten a lot of notes and emails on it. Um, I'd like to thank Vaishna, um, Satyamuthi, and Kubes Nava for joining us, and Krishna, uh, Saravanamuthu, and Thomas Savundra for calling in with their thoughts as well. And here are our final thoughts for the day. This week, the world lost a great and courageous man who served as an inspiration for many, Nelson Mandela. The team at Crossroads passes on our sympathies to his family, South Africa, and all Canadians saddened by his passing. We leave you with a quote of his. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Thank you all for joining us. You've been watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Have a great week. Tamil Indian Bob, Uncle TV.